This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Undo Software. Debugging C++ is hard, which is why Undo Software's technology is proven to reduce debugging time by up to two-thirds. Memory corruptions, resource leaks, race conditions, and logic errors can now be fixed quickly and easily. So visit undo-software.com to find out how its next-generation debugging technology can help you find and fix your bugs in minutes, not weeks. CPP Cast is also sponsored by CPPCon, the annual week-long face-to-face gathering for the entire C++ community. Get your ticket now during early bird registration until July 1st. Episode 50 of CPP Cast with guest Jonathan Beard, recorded March 21st, 2016. In this episode, we talk about the new version of Sea Lion. Then we talk to Jonathan Beard, author of Raft Lib. Jonathan talks to us about stream processing using Raft. Welcome to episode 50 of CPP Cast, the only podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Rob. Uh, well, how about you? I'm, I'm doing pretty good. It's episode 50. It's a nice round number. A little celebration for that. We Maybe should have far. cake. I had cake the other day. Oh. Uh, we'll have to share some. It's almost Easter. I'm always making a cake for that. Peeps? Yeah, yeah. They so made little bunnies to go on it. It's pretty cute. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. But you had some news to share, right? Yeah, I've uh, started on a little side project lately, and I just thought I'd mention it on the podcast. I've been recording some live coding sessions and some random topics. Um, I'm calling it C++ Weekly, and I just released my third episode of it this morning. Awesome. So that's uh, something our listeners may or may not be interested in checking out i guess <laughs> i watched the first one and enjoyed it i'll have to catch up with the other two though i need to get That's... on a subscribe list or something i i got good feedback or good mm-hmm. responses to the second one i i got okay. like basically two thousand views in the first week and a hundred subscribers to the youtube channel oh, wow. so I, i'm not disappointed yeah it's very good Okay, well, at the top of every episode, I like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got an email from Florian. He writes in, I recently stumbled upon a SIMD library by a guy named Agner Fogg. His vector class library is a convenient wrapper for SIMD intrinsics. They can detect the host hardware capabilities and automatically perform dynamic dispatching for the best port instruction set. Uh, he says he doesn't know Agner personally, but he really likes the library, and uh, he hopes we can get him on the show. Definitely sounds like it'd be an interesting topic, right, Jason? It does sound like it'd be an interesting topic. Something that we've kind of touched on. Jason, you still there? Yes. Hello? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It does sound like an interesting topic, something we've touched on a few times, and I could dive into some more, I would think. And it's always nice to look at new libraries. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. Uh, You can always reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter, and you can email us at feedback at cppcast.com. And don't forget us to leave us those iTunes reviews. Uh, Joining us today is Jonathan Beard. Jonathan received a BS in biology and a BA in international studies in 2005 from the Louisiana State University. And he got his MS in bioinformatics in 2010 from the John Hopkins University and a PhD in computer science from Washington University in St. Louis in 2015. Jonathan served as a U.S. Army officer through 2010, where he served in roles ranging from medical administrator to acting director of the medical informatics department for the U.S. Army in Europe. Jonathan's research interests include online modeling, stream parallel systems, streaming architectures, compute near data, and massively parallel processing. He is currently a senior research engineer with ARM Research in Austin, Texas. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks. I think I've uh, done way too much now that you've read that. (laughs) Or at least spent way too way too long in school. It, I was just thinking you have four times as many degrees as I do. 
And, and you did all that while serving as an army officer? That's pretty no, impressive. No, I did the uh, I did the first two um, before, and then I joined the army for some reason, and <laughs> <laughs> then I uh, got a master's, and then I did a PhD. Very nice. So PhD was after. Were you stationed in a lot of places? Did they move you around a lot? Oh yeah, so I mean, I was uh, I spent a little bit of time in South Korea in uh, Dongdu Chan, which is pretty close to the uh, DMZ, wow. and then I spent the rest of my time in Heidelberg in uh, Germany. Oh, wow, wow, we were just in years. Heidelberg last year. Oh, well, it's nice. Yeah, did that's... you guys uh, spend a lot of time in downtown, or where'd you uh, hang out? Uh, we stayed at a hostel. Uh, we were only there one night, actually, but we stayed at a hostel that was right at the base of the Heidelberg Castle, and then awesome. we spent some time downtown and along the river. Yeah. Very nice. So did you go to the, uh, was it the, oh, Hemingway's Cafe on the river? It's no, no, places. we just did lots and lots of walking along the river, actually. <laughs> I think we walked something like 15 kilometers that day, according to my wife's pedometer. Wow. So did you uh, convert it to kilometers when you went over there and then convert it back to miles? Uh, no, actually, it would always counted in miles while we were there, <laughs> but we were talking to the locals, so we converted it to kilometers for them, and now I can't, I, I was just thinking about it in kilometers. <laughs> I gotcha. <laughs> I was just curious. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, well, we have a couple uh, news articles to go through, Jonathan. Feel free to jump in and comment on any of these, and then we'll talk to you about your uh, raft library. Yeah, sure, uh, man. This first one is Sea Lion 2016.1 was just released, and uh, they they just changed their versioning because I think it was you know 1.2 or 1.3 the last time we talked about it, and that's now they're calling point. it 2016.1. Uh, I guess that's an easy way to just track how many releases they're doing in a year, and you always know kind of how up to date your uh, your build is, you know. It's yeah. 2015.1, you're a year old probably. But uh, lots of new features in here. Um, better C++ language support. Um, variadic templates are in there now. That's very nice. More code generation. Uh, new features for CMake. A new feature called Reset CMake Cache. And they also added Python and Swift support in addition to C++. Um, now that Swift is open source, I guess they're able to do that. It's not restricted to uh, the Mac platform. Yeah, that's some interesting stuff. A couple of people, you know, there's still a couple of things still missing, like const expert support, but sure. it's it's awesome to see them continue developing it. Yeah, and it's still just a really good option to have, especially if you're on Linux and you're looking for a good IDE if you're not able to work with uh, Vim or Emacs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, next article. Uh, yes, I'm say Jason. No. Oh, God. <laughs> um, this next one is a Q and A with uh, Bjarne Struestrup about C plus plus seventeen, of course, and he's going over his thoughts with uh, this InfoWorld uh, reporter. It's kind of interesting to see C plus plus talk in like the real news, but uh, it it is such an important language, so I guess it does make sense. Um, and it's just nice to see Bjarna's thoughts. Um, obviously, we've been talking a lot about C++17 for the last few weeks. He's going over his thoughts about what he thinks are the major features and what we have to see in the future. Is there anything you wanted to call out in this article he's got, you guys? Uh, I did notice that he mentions he's a little disappointed that concepts aren't making it in. He personally thinks they are ready. Right. It'll be, um, it'll be interesting to see how soon they do get in. It did sound like that vote was very close. Yeah. Yeah. So have you guys played around with concepts at all, out of curiosity? Uh, no. No, I have no. not. Okay. Have you, Jonathan? I have not. That's why I was wondering if you... <laughs> okay. There is a keynote from Andrew Sutton from last year's C++ Now that is up on YouTube uh, that he, he goes through um, what concepts will cover, and I think it's a, it's a pretty good... It's a good video, and I, it would be worth watching if you want to get like a high-level view of it. One uh, interesting note here uh, that Bjarna makes at the end of the article is, you know, he was asked if it would have made sense to delay shipping C++17 for a little bit to uh, get concepts in there. And he makes a good point that that would have made it, you know, instead of C++17, it would have been 18. And then we would have probably had C++22 or 23 instead of 20, so... Sticking to this three-year cycle, uh, he, he believes in, and, and I think I can agree with that. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, this next article is about a new library called, uh, just called Subprocess. It's a uh, subprocessing for C++. Uh, yes. He based it on Python's subprocess module, and he wanted to bring that type of feature into C++, and he couldn't really find an, another library. He said Boost Process was the closest one he could find, and uh, it wasn't lightweight enough, and I guess it wasn't actually an official Boost library. Is that right? Yeah, that's what he says. I, I would have sworn it was if I had been asked, but... I, I, you know, yeah. I had to believe him. I've only used Q process extensively, so there is uh, that exists also. Actually, it, it does seem like a pretty powerful library. So if this is something you're looking for, it has piping support. And uh, yeah, is there anything else you want to add to this one, Jason? Um, if uh, I would say if it supported Windows, I would probably already be using it. Oh right, it is a Linux only it, library, right? It is. It's Linux yeah. and Mac, I believe. Right. Right. No. No. He says Linux. Oh, yeah, Linux and Mac, sorry. Okay. Right. Cool. Well, Jonathan, let's start talking to you. Um, could you maybe give us an overview of what stream processing is? Well, so in a nutshell, stream processing is writing a program that's communicating with multiple actors. And so instead of composing the program as functions, you think of each one of those functions as, say, a pure function with no side effects. And you're communicating with what is the outside world or your other um, compute kernels, um, in this case is what you usually call them, um, via distinct um, ports. And so you're writing into, or you're reading into and then writing out to uh, multiple FIFO ports. And so it's a nice simple way of composing the application that can be executed in parallel without side effects and without having to worry about all the non-determinism that really makes like traditional parallel processing difficult. Comparing your streams uh, to futures, which is the highest level threading construct that's in the standard library today, uh, how does uh, this is even higher level than that? Correct. Um, yeah, I would definitely consider it higher level than uh, than that. I mean, you can. Uh, it, right now, I can compose one of my applications with the uh, Raft library with, you know, essentially the right shift operators connecting kernels together and execute them in parallel and then let it go, which is kind of nice. Okay. okay. Whereas futures, I mean, it requires a little bit more work and a little bit more thought. And overall, the construction is definitely not side effect free. Although one thing within C++, unfortunately, there's really not not a good way to do... I mean, I wish there was, say, like a pure keyword, which would be awesome. And so you could specify a function not to have any external dependencies and then enforce that at a language level, but we can't really do that yet. Interesting. So if a user wanted to use your library with non-pure functions, you have no way of preventing that? Oh, you can cause all kinds of craziness, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. The, uh, if, if you stick to the specified API, then everything works nicely. But as with anything C or C++, you can still shoot yourself in the foot if you really try hard enough. Uh, so can you give us, like, I know it's difficult on, on air, if you will, to uh, describe programming concepts, but what does this actually look like from the user perspective if you want to set up a stream, and how does the parallelization come into play? Well, the easiest way would be to look at an example on the GitHub repo. However, um, right. <laughs> so if you're constructing an application, you extend a base class, which is a kernel class, and then you interact, well, you set up ports first, which is the way you interact with the outside world. And so you have multiple name ports, you set up a type for any of those, everything's strictly typed, and then you instantiate um, basically the run virtual function with whatever you want, and this is how you actually do work. And then... In your main class, when you're actually putting these together, or, well, you can do it in a function, however you want to, but you instantiate a map, and then you do the add assign operator overload to the map class, and you add to the map a string of kernels. And when you instantiate those kernels, they're connected via uh, FIFO-like um, constructs. And it's really abstracted away from the user. So those FIFOs could actually be anything. So it could be shared memory, TCP, um, could be heap, it could be um, essentially whatever. The point is the user has no idea, and it's still executed just as if, you know, just as you specified the topology of the application. Um, but the runtime takes care of the rest. 
Okay, so the named ports are automatically paired up by your system based on the input and output names being the same or something like that? Yeah, so essentially you'd say, you know, um, so if you had foo um, with an output port of X and then bar with an input port of X, and you can connect those up via the right shift operator. So you have one on the left-hand side, then you have the right shift operator, and then you have your kernel you're connecting it to on the opposite side, that right shift operator. And then you just add those to a map, and that makes one link between the X and the Y. Okay. Ports of those two kernels. They don't have to be the same name. They just have to be the same compatible type. I see. And you use the C++ static typing system to ensure that they're expecting the Um, same types? Yeah, it's actually a little more complicated than that, but yes. And so everything's dynamic, and so it actually checks the type at runtime. But yeah, it does use the, uh, well, it actually uses the type ID, and so the runtime type information to get the types. Okay. So can you have multiple writers writing to one reader or multiple readers from one writer, that kind of thing? So right now, the way you'd actually do that is you'd have one... Um, if you look at it as a producer consumer, you'd have one producer and you could have multiple consumers, but the way that would actually be implemented under the hood, um, would be either dynamically adding more ports to the producer, um, which would be transparent to the user, or you'd have what amounts to like a fork kernel, which would split the output. Okay. All right. So then anything that can then run in parallel does. Exactly. And so it's not just like running in parallel, but I mean, it's running, you're, you're really, um, you're performing computation while you're doing the memory accesses. And so you're overlapping both of those and, you know, essentially doing pipeline parallelism plus task and data parallelism at the same time. So does your system then manage how many threads are running at a time for you? Yes. Okay. So that's one thing I've been working on. So it actually was a lot cooler a few uh, a few months ago, but I was asked to add Windows support, <laughs> and I'm uh, <laughs> discovering how much um, how much I'm having to strip out of the Linux API to make everything work nicely um, with Windows, and I'm working on putting it back together. And so the vision of this was to well make parallel programming easier because initially I was doing biosciences and computational biology, and I wanted to be able to write super parallel programs because most everything is really easily parallelizable if you work at it. And uh, just about everything I looked at, you have to know lots about the software and lots about the hardware. And initially, I didn't want to become a hardware expert, although I am now. I work for him. <laughs> um, that's actually one of the paths I took to get here, but that's a segue. Um, yeah, you shouldn't have to know all the information about the cache structure of the hardware you're working on. You shouldn't have to know... All- you know, any of that stuff. You should be able to sit down and write a relatively performant parallel programming or a program. And I think that's, you know, Raftlib is one way of doing that. Okay. So that's actually the first time you just mentioned the name of the library, but, um, <laughs> right. Raftlib, uh, I think it says on the website that you actually, uh, at one point was Raft language. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you went from a Raft language to the Raft lib C++ library? Oh man, that's a, that's actually a long story, okay. but <laughs> we have a few minutes. So sure. I, uh, so I start off my thesis and I, I really wanted to model, um, stream parallel systems. And so I was going to do mathematical modeling and as any young grad student wants to do, they want to go write their own language because languages are cool. And so I sat down and started writing a language, and I got so far as writing the entire BNF. So I have a full front end for the language. It's actually on GitHub if anybody ever cares to go take a look. Um, but what I did not get around to was writing the back end. I, I came to the realization one night that there are thousands of languages out there. I mean, literally thousands. If you go on <laughs> GitHub, every grad student, undergrad, and probably even every 13-year-old, you know, that learns how to program basic, you know, programming skills, they want to go write their own language. But almost none of these ever take off. I mean, you can, you know, name the upstarts, you know, on one hand that have actually made it into the top 10 list. And I can guarantee you almost every single one of those, well, with the exception of Rust, which I'm not sure if it's actually become a um, major language yet, although I do like it. Um, Almost every one of those has huge corporate backing behind it and incentives for programmers to use. I mean, look at Swift. Would anyone have actually 
picked up Swift over, say, Rust if, it, if Apple wasn't behind it or if one of these other big companies was not behind the language. And I had a realization that nobody was going to use Raft language. And so what do I do? I, I went and looked at what was most popular out there and what people actually use for performance and ease of use. And it turns out C++ is still you know, the primary vehicle for getting relatively high performance at a relatively high level. And so I decided to go build a template library. And so I pulled all the stuff that I had started building for the Raft language, and I packaged it up and put it in the library. And then built a little bit more of a meta template programming around it to make it look semi-decent. And then I used it for my thesis. So how long ago was that transition to the Raft library? When did you start the Raft library, I guess? Um, well, I actually had the realization while I was flying to Florence um, for a conference, and so I can probably narrow it down to September of 2014. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, while sipping coffee on a plane, I was like, you know what? This isn't going to work. Let's, uh, let's build a library. And so by the time I actually landed back in the States, I had, the, uh, had a good start to the library. I've been hacking on it in my spare time ever since. Very cool. I wanted to interrupt this discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. You have an extensive test suite, right? You're using TDD, continuous integration, and other best practices. But do all your tests pass all of the time? Getting to the bottom of intermittent and obscure test failures is crucial if you want to get the full value from these practices. And Undo Software's live recorder technology allows you to easily fix the bugs that don't otherwise get fixed. Capture a recording of failing tests in your test suites and debug them offline so that you can collaborate with your development teams and customers. Get your software out of development and into production much more quickly, and be confident that it is of higher quality. Visit undo-software.com to see how they can help you find out exactly what your software really did, as opposed to what you expected it to do, and fix your bugs in minutes, not weeks. So what, what state would you say RAF library is in currently? Uh, is it something you would recommend C++ developers go try out, or is it still fairly unstable? Um, well, the API itself is fairly fairly stable. I've actually had a um, decent user base so far, okay. and they've had you know, quite a few comments. And I think it's to a point where I'm not going to have to change anything to add Windows support. The um, Yeah, I, I, pretty much... The API is totally stable. The only changes might come on the back end, and those are mostly going to be transparent to the user. One thing that I want to add back in sooner rather than later is the multi-node support. And so one of the cool things I had worked on as a grad student were, like I mentioned, um, TCP connections. So you can actually um, communicate from one node to the next. So it basically runs a daemon on each one of the um, server nodes and tells your home node what's running elsewhere. And so you can load balance and optimize at a more global level as opposed to simply running on one machine. So I don't know about you guys, but I have lots of extra computers of various vintages running around my house. And sometimes I really want to use all of them. So, yeah. So that's interesting. So did the multi-node support then require you to have the same program installed on each computer, I assume? Well, the... the, uh, the program that actually needs to be installed in each computer is the daemon, which um, gets everything kicked off. Um, what you need, um, once you actually hit uh, execute on the host computer or the start computer, um, is access to the um, original code. And so basically it sends the code around and recompiles it. And then all I need to know are the indexes of which virtual functions. And so when you distribute your computation, you're not actually sending in real time the binary itself, you're sending you know, the code ahead of time, it gets recompiled and then loaded. Um, there's other ways you could do that as, as in shared libraries or fat binaries, but really there's got to be a you know, better way to get around having, uh, say, looking to my left, my old um, Power Mac G5 on the <laughs> same network as my uh, newer uh, Mac Pro. So to be perfectly clear, you're saying ship the source code around. Yeah, exactly. And so essentially old school just-in-time compilation, unless you can pack a fat, fat binary with multiple uh, you know, sets of assembly code, basically. Okay, so you ship the source code off. The source code is built on the receiving daemon. Then what mechanism do you use for streaming or serializing the data between them? 
Well, so you send the index of which function within, so the runtime itself creates a, like a numbered list, essentially, of all the um, raft kernels that you've instantiated. And so it knows what's there. And so it matches up basically the string representation that the host computer is saying, hey, I want to stream data to this function. And so the other binary knows, hey, I need to pick up this function that matches this string and load the hash and load the function and then begin executing it. And so basically that's fed through from the daemon that executes the uh, binary itself as one of its arguments. Wow. All right. So um, although long story short, that needs to be made a little bit more performant than it is now, which is one of the reasons I pulled it out. Well, that and Windows compatibility. Yeah, that's what I was going to get at next, because uh, cross-platform compatibility is kind of one of my things. So you, you said you had to pull out some features for Windows, and that was one of them? That was one of them. And so I'm fairly good at Linux and Mac network programming, but I am uh, learning all the uh, you know nuances of doing that on the Windows platform. Okay. So you're doing this from, from scratch, if you will. You're not using Boost oh, yeah. Asio or something. Yeah, so I'm uh, I am doing this from scratch. Although I've considered using uh, Boost, the um, initial reason for that is, well, so I put the Boost demangle library um, embedded within mm. uh, Raftlib now instead of using the uh, simple CXX ABI interface, which I guess the Boost one calls it under the hood anyways. But the uh, yeah, I had a few um, complaints about that. So initially, I was trying to keep as few um, external dependencies as possible. But, um, yeah, I totally agree. It would be uh, much easier to rely sometimes on more external libraries. All right, so this is just a little bit of a tangent, but you did you, <laughs> you pulled out the uh, the Boost uh, demangle library? Um, oh, no, no, no. I left the Boost demangle library. I pulled out the cxxabi.h. No, no, I mean, um, oh. are you requiring Boost, or did you extract the pieces of Boost that oh, you need? Oh, no, no, no. It, uh, so when you actually run the CMake file, it does the git pull on the version of the uh, demangle within git. Okay. Hmm. And so it downloads the you know version and the reference for the uh, actual copy that I used. So, there, so that way, you, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was saying, so that way you get the exact version, no changes, et cetera, matches up nicely. Okay. There is an official tool from Boost for extracting just a piece of it yes. that you need, and I've, I can't remember the name of it. I just thought I'd mention if that might be helpful to you. Yeah, I've uh, I, I ran across that. Although I don't know, I, I kind of like the CMake Git um, submodule download. Sure. But yeah, it just seems like a nice way of packaging things up, so that way it's all just transparent relatively to the user. Okay. I like easy. So you said you've already gotten a fair bit of uh, user feedback. Uh, what types of applications are developers building with uh, with Raflib? Um, so right now it's mainly um, my test stuff. And so most of the people that have used it have used it for things like computer vision. So for instance, hmm. um, I had one guy that, and this is, I, actually this drives a lot of the uh, development worker feature requests. And so I had one guy that wanted to use OpenCV um, with Raflib. And getting the um, CV matrix um, objects, the smart objects, to work nicely was a uh, challenge at first. So their uh, internal reference counting was a little bit different than um, some of the other um, smart objects I'd run into. So it's making sure the uh, destructors and constructors are all called nicely. The um, It's kind of funny. So the uh, Raftlib FIFO interface is actually three separate interface templates under the hood which are all called um, for different size objects. And so you have one template that's called for the a certain L1 decash size. And then you have another template that's called for objects. And then you have another one that's called for very large objects. And it all optimizes where, uh, where and how the data is pushed to and pulled from. Interesting. So if you're, if you're, Taking data like that and pushing it over the wire for uh, your daemon-based solution, like I'm still just wondering how in the world you deal with the different binary formats. Like, say you're sucking it off of a 64-bit Intel onto your G4, like you were saying, G5. G5, yeah. Uh, then you have to go, you know, change all the uh, Indianness, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So is that something that the user has to oh, no, no, no. That's tell your... 
That's taken you, care of. Yeah, that's taken care of by the daemon. So when the data stream is actually pushed over, the receiving daemon checks and it says, "Okay, this is coming from an Intel machine. I need to change this from little to big, and done, or vice versa." Wow. Okay. Hmm. That was one of my uh, pet peeves: is giving the user too much stuff to do and too much stuff to manage. I mean, it has to be done, and you have the information for the runtime to do it. Why not just go ahead and do it? Right. Okay. Um, are you the sole contributor to Raft, or are you taking other contributions from the community? Oh, I'm always taking other contributions. We've uh, I've only had a few small ones so far, but yeah, if anybody else would love to, you know, I'd be happy to receive input. I'm curious if you've done any performance testing for how well it scales up. Uh, so the performance testing I've done so far was only on one machine, and so we've scaled it up to I think 64 physical cores. And yeah, so far so good. The um, feature that I was most interested in scaling up was the automatic parallelization. Uh huh. And so, if you give it single entry, single ex- exit sections within the graph, because I guess I skipped that part. So the Raft library looks at the application as a directed graph, and so uh-huh. the the user gives it out of order hints as it's as the user is constructing the application itself. And so the runtime can look for single entry, single exit sections of the graph that are allowed to be out of order. And so it doesn't really matter what order the input or the output is. And so it can take those and then duplicate the kernels that are within that single entry, single exit section and basically parallelize the heck out of it. Um, so that's what I was looking for um, with the scale up experiments. And so far, so good. Um, it does fairly well. Um, it does better when you use the partitioning library, which is another one of those things I pulled out temporarily. And so I've used both Metis and Scotch uh, partitioning libraries, and you can partition the application to um, really take advantage of data locality. And so you partition based on locality and scheduling. And so you want to schedule things close together that are highly communicative and further apart um, when they're not. In other words, to spread out the computation and minimize the data movement. Okay. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so there's one interesting example with uh, the parallel BZIP, which I posted online. I need to go do a threading building blocks, which I just found the um, implementation and run it on the same hardware. And so I just wanted to show how easy it was to construct a parallel BZIP with Raftlib as opposed to the um, classic one that's already out there and then compare the performance across threads. Um, it was actually quite good. It actually outperformed the standard pthreads based BZIP. Very good. So, uh, go ahead, Rob. <laughs> now, I was just going to ask about uh, you're going to have a talk at C now, and uh, is there anything you're going to go over in that talk that you haven't talked to us about yet? Oh, lots. <laughs> <laughs> I even uh, so I left out all the mathematical details and interesting background stories and uh, yeah, there's lots of fun queuing networks and machine learning and other uh, API stuff that I could definitely uh, talk about and I do plan on it. I also plan on doing a little bit of uh, live coding towards the end because I mean that's really the fun part. Yeah, <laughs> actually we can't really do that on the air. Yeah, I know. I was disappointed. You had to figure out a way to do that over audio. <laughs> <laughs> do it in Morse code. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. Or have like the uh, you know the old you know audio modems tone. You could uh, you know have people pick up a uh, microphone, and hold it up. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, I just um, maybe for a kind of a wrap up kind of uh, clarification for me, I'm building this mental model in my head that your s- streaming library kind of feels like. A, um, a build tool that has a bunch of files that need to be compiled and a build system can automatically determine the dependencies, parallelize the bits that it can, and then link the objects together at the end. Is that is that a fair comparison? Um, kind of, but it's also more of a... I'd say it's a build tool plus built-in OpenMP plus MPI um, with a way to, you know, hook together a computation and not just build it. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that's all I have, Jason. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So you've got Mac and Linux support right now, but in Windows you're working on, right? Windows I'm working on. So I've got the uh, 
I'm working on getting this sea make to build right now, which is fun. So if you want to contribute to that, feel free. <laughs> uh, but I might take a look at it uh, after the show. <laughs> we'll see. Did you have any idea when the Windows port might be ready? I was aiming for the end of March. Okay. Well, you've got a few days. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm uh, I'm heading to a conference tomorrow, so I think I will uh, work it on the plane. I'm, I'm uh, very very close. And I'm assuming this uh, already compiles with GCC and Clang and on oh, yeah. Windows, you're targeting Visual C++. And, and it's also run through um, Travis CI for uh, continuous integration. So every uh, every push gets checked. But don't forget about AppFair once you get your Windows <laughs> stuff working. Of course. Very cool. It's very helpful that way. Well, Jonathan, it's been great having you on the show. Uh, where can people find you online or learn more about Raflib? Um, so you can go to my website. It's uh, jonathanbeard.io, or you can go to uh, raftlib.io. Okay. And the repo's on GitHub, and you can check it out there, right? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having for uh, letting us have you, have you on the show. Awesome. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks so much for listening as we chat about C++. I love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in, or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear that also. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate it if you can follow cppcast on Twitter and like cppcast on Facebook. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. At cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.